It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, my mentor, Dr. Peter Friedman. He is Chief Research Officer and Endowed Chair for Clinical Research at Bay State Health and Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State. Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Friedman, Chief Research Officer and Endowed Chair for Research at Bay State Health. And I'm speaking today about stigma and bias in substance use disorders. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Rich Sates and Miriam Komoromi um, for some slides that have been adapted for this presentation. I have no other disclosures. This is a case of a 55-year-old patient with diabetes mellitus who presents with near syncope and hemoglobin A1C of 13. The patient tells the clinician that despite the diabetes, he has not been able to give up eating a quart of ice cream daily. And on hearing this, the clinician states, I can't start insulin if you're not going to help yourself first. Here's a list of nutritionists. When you show me you're ready to stop ice cream, then we can consider insulin. The clinician discharges the patient home without further treatment. I think many of us agree that this is an uncommon scenario. But let's contrast it with this 45-year-old woman with opioid use disorder who presents after an overdose. She tells the clinician that despite her overdose, she's not been able to stop using opioids. And on hearing this, the clinician states, I can't start treatment if you're not going to help yourself first. Here's a list of outpatient addiction, addiction clinics. If you show me that you're ready to stop using drugs, then we consider medication treatment for your opioid use disorder. The clinician then discharges the patient home with a list of programs and no further treatment. Unfortunately, Many of us have seen this as a quite common scenario. Stigma, according to Irving Goffman, is a process by which the reaction of others spoils normal identity. And in spite of all we know about the causes and pathophysiology of substance use disorders, which will be go on, gone over in detail in the rest of this course, there's still a tremendous amount of stigma associated with these conditions. Stigma interferes with all aspects of the patient provider relationship. It impacts patient trust and willingness to start and adhere to treatment. It influences providers' feelings towards the patient. It has even been associated with differences in behaviors towards our patients, going so far as to sometimes interfere with us being willing to provide life saving treatment. Stigma affects the perception and behavior of patients who internalize the negative feelings, their loved ones, the general public, scientists and clinicians, and it also affects the quality of care and healthcare policies that affect uh, individuals with these disorders. There are generally three factors that moderate stigma. The first is causal attribution. Do we believe that whatever the condition is that the person caused that they choose it, that they chose it? Um, is it or is it not their fault? The second is perceived control. Can they help it? They either can or they can't help it. And the third is moral attribution. Are they worthy of our care and concern? Um, you know, said simply, are they monsters? Um, are they the other? Or are they humans with flaws like me? In terms of the first paradigm, thinking about whether addiction is a choice, no one chooses addiction. And even if first use is a choice, repeated use leads to brain changes that reduce the capacity to stop. Indeed, impaired control is an explicit symptom of the disease. Many people begin using in adolescence or uh, early young adulthood um, when the brain is not fully developed. People uh, experiment um, and decision-making is often not optimal. None of those people chooses, says, oh, well, when I grow up, I wanna be addicted. Um, so often, it is this initial choice that has unintended consequences. Addiction also has multifactorial genetic and environmental causes 
like any other disease, certainly individuals don't choose those. Those are imposed on them. Now, folks will say, well, not all use is addiction. And that's true, not all use is a disease. However, all use is a risky behavior and clearly the way we manage other risky behaviors is different than the way we think about this. We certainly treat the consequences of other risky behavior. So how do we view and manage other controllable risky behaviors and their consequences? We understand that these are risk factors for diseases. So the race car driver who gets in an accident, even though he made the choice, ends up in the burn unit, we don't deny him the skin graft. Um, the skier uh, who chooses to ski and breaks her leg, uh, even though she made the choice to ski, we, we do uh, address these conditions with meds, with counsel, with surgery. We do all the things that are proven to work. The patient with risk factors for cardiovascular disease, we provide start state-of-the-art cardiac treatment. We don't say to them, oh, you had unhealthy habits. Come back when you stop those unhealthy habits. But the way we treat folks with substance use disorders is quite different. We tell them just stop on your own. We tell them uh, in, in, pre in our society, it's often, uh, jail and prison really is the, is, is the major treatment option that's offered. Now, we don't say to these folks, oh, um, for the race car driver, we don't say, we're not gonna give you a seatbelt uh, to make your driving safer because it's just gonna encourage you to drive faster. And we don't say to the skier, we're not gonna fix your broken leg because it's just gonna encourage you to ski again. Um, we don't do any of those things. So I think it's worthwhile thinking a little bit about how we think about risky behaviors in medicine and why is this different. Words contribute to the stigma. And when we refer to someone as the substance abuser, it applies that willful misconduct, that it's their fault and they can help it. As opposed to saying they have a substance use disorder, which implies a medical disorder that is really not their fault and they cannot help it. Uh, is this just semantics or political correctness? Well, there is research to help us think about that. A, a nice, an elegant study done by uh, John Kelly up at Mass General uh, randomized 516 mental health clinicians to receive two vignettes, one, one of two vignettes. Um, these were doctoral level uh, clinicians um, or, or master's level clinicians. And the, the two vignettes, the first vignette uses the word substance abuser to refer to this patient, Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams is a substance abuser, he's attending a treatment program through the court. As part of the program, he's required to remain absent from drugs and other alcohol and other drugs. He's been compliant until a month ago when he had two positive screens. And it, you know, sort of goes on, um, to say that he's been a substance abuser for the past few years. He now waits appointment with his judge to determine his status. And then it asks a series of questions about what the person believes the judge should do. The second vignette, which folks, other folks received, uses the term, the appropriate term, substance use disorder. Mr. Williams has a substance use disorder, attending a treatment program through the court, um, et cetera. Uh, exact same vignette, except using different language for the condition. And what Kelly's study showed quite uh, definitively is that um, when we compare responses to using a term like a person with substance use disorder versus substance abuser, the substance abuser was felt to be more likely to be personally culpable for his condition, and respondents were more likely to feel like his problem is caused by a reckless lifestyle. He's responsible for causing his condition, his problem. And clinicians were more likely to agree that punitive measures should be administered to the substance abuser rather than to the person with substance use disorder, that he should be given some sort of jail sentence to serve as a wake up call. So clearly the way we speak does affect how we approach patients and our actions. 
which is why we are encouraging uh, everyone within Bay State Health to use medically accurate person-first language in speaking with or, uh, or about uh, persons with substance use disorders, because the language we choose does shape the way we treat our patients. So we should avoid terms like drug abuse and speak about substance use disorder instead. We should clearly avoid terms like addict or junkie. We are, these are persons with a substance use disorder. Um, similarly, alcoholic, a person is, is defining the person by their disease. This is a person with alcohol use disorder. And then the terms dirty and clean are quite problematic because they imply something about the person. When we're talking about toxicologic testing, we, like we do for any other test, we should talk about an abnormal or a positive test uh, or an unexpected uh, urine test result. We should not be speaking about clean or dirty. And similarly for the person, we should be using terms like in remission, uh, abstinent, in recovery, when they, are, um, when they are no longer using. And instead of using the term dirty, um, you really should be speaking that the person's had a recurrence of disease, an exacerbation of disease, or a relapse. Similarly, we should avoid street language like shooting up. Really, we're, we're talking about injection behavior, and that's, that's the type of language that we should be using. Medication for addiction treatment is also similarly stigmatized. And you, you, you often hear folks talk about it as substituting one drug for another. But the thing to bear in mind is that the symptoms of addiction, which the American Society of Addiction Medicine calls the four C's, compulsive use, loss of control over use, continued use despite consequences, and craving. All of those symptoms are worsened when people are using short-acting drugs. And all of those symptoms are extinguished or reduced when you get people on appropriate medication. So it really is a treatment for the condition. Similarly, uh, euphoria seeking is, is prominent when folks are on uh, using drugs versus report, people reporting that they feel normal when they are on appropriate medication treatment. And finally, when we look at functioning, um, people who are on medication uh, function in a pro-social way, they work, they spend time with their kids versus the antisocial behaviors that are seen with um, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, illicit drug use. So, so the notion that medication is just the same uh, it, it is really not based in any um, medical reality. And we don't refer to medication assisted treatment for diabetes. And we really shouldn't use that language for, um, for substance use disorder. In both cases, for substance use disorders and opioid use disorders, we uh, are providing superphysiologic doses of a ligand to compensate for downregulated receptors, which is to say that because of chronic use or um, other problems with those receptors, we need to give higher doses in, of, of uh, insulin in the case of diabetes, or an opiate in the case, an ag opiate agonist in the case of opiate use disorder, so that functioning will return to normal. But we never speak of insulin as assisting the nutrition and exercise. And we never tell people with diabetes that they need to come off their insulin. So uh, clearly the way we speak about medication for opiate disorder does stigmatize people uh, who are on it. It makes them more likely to uh, internalize those feelings and do some things like coming off that can have fatal consequences. So we really should avoid terms like medication assisted or substitution therapy. We should really be talking about medication treatment, opioid agonist treatment, um, uh, and the like. You also hear that uh, people on medication that it's not considered true recovery. Um, and what, what I say to this is, you know, just because you needed oxygen to reach the top of Everest doesn't diminish the achievement. Achieving recovery, stopping use, getting your life back is an incredible achievement. Just because somebody need, need, needed help from the medication uh, doesn't make it 
any less of a really amazing achievement. And we really should recognize that. Um, among people who, the thing that's really interesting, among people who work with patients with substance use disorders, their views of the condition is very different from those who are non-prescribers. So uh, when we look at the study, um, the, the, in terms of seeing treating addiction as difficult, 95% um, of non-prescribers of buprenorphine uh, believe that it's difficult versus only 82% of the buprenorphine prescribers. And, 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 and you know, no one would say that it's easy, but you know, few things worth doing well in medicine are easy. But when we look at things like uh, buprenorphine is effective treatment, 91% of the buprenorphine prescribers say that's true versus only 53% of the non-prescribers. My patients are with opioid addiction are motivated to quit. 82% of buprenorphine providers versus only 36% of non-prescribers. And my patients would be satisfied with buprenorphine. 91% of buprenorphine providers versus only 35%. So people who are doing this work understand that this really is a treatable condition, that these patients do extremely well, and that you see really incredible improvements in their health um, and well-being when they are on medication. Um, when we see this 45-year-old person with lung cancer, we understand and recognize that even though she's weak, and bedridden, and lost her hair, there is more to her in terms of her personhood. And we recognize that we should not define her by her disease. But we often don't do the same for persons with substance use disorder. And a first step in reducing our own stigma is to recognize that a person should not be defined by their disease. You probably remember this patient we presented at the start of the lecture. Her name is Melissa Lee Matos. And here's another picture of Melissa in treatment for her substance use disorder. She's bravely documented her struggle with substance use disorder online for others to learn from, which can be found by scanning the QR code. So often our stigma in patients with substance use disorder originates from our bias and seeing them as uh, at their worst when they are struggling with their disease. And we mistakenly attribute their disease to their personhood. And this is a fundamental attribution error and it's a very common form of bias, but we have to understand that what we're seeing is the disease, not the person. So how can we take these concepts and apply them to our practice? Well, regardless of where we are in the medical system uh, and what our role is, we can, there's a lot we can do to address substance use disorders. So clinicians can screen, ask matter-of-factly. Um, if you ask people matter-of-factly, uh, it it's non-stigmatizing. It's sort of a matter, the same way you ask any other question. How many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or prescription medication for non-medical reasons? And you know, nine times out of 10, you will get a very uh, clear and honest answer. You should speak to patients with compassion and understanding. That doesn't, shouldn't need to be said, but we often uh, hear stories from people with substance use disorders who are sp spoken to um, with less than full compassion and understanding given their condition. We should recommend and initiate treatment. And for those who are not ready for treatment, as we'll hear in the rest of this course, we should do whatever we can to meet them where they are, to reduce their risk of harm, um, because at some point in the future, they may be ready for recovery, and the kind words that you say may be the impetus for them to seek it. And finally, we should always use non-pejorative, person-first, medically accurate language in talking to these patients, talking about them, and talking about their condition. And so I want to encourage you uh, to take the uh, Bay State Health Words Matter Pledge. This is launching uh, over the next few weeks, um, and it will be a chance to go online and pledge to stop the stigma associated with addiction. Acknowledging that words matter, what we say and how we say it really does make a difference. And what the pledge says is, I believe that the words I use in talking about substance use disorder are important in reducing stigma. The pledge to treat all people with a substance use disorder with dignity, respect, a pledge to talk about addiction as a chronic illness, not as a moral failing, 
and I pledge to be a leader in reducing stigma and promoting recovery from this disease. Uh, I hope you will join uh, us in signing the pledge um, and treating persons with substance use disorder with the dignity and respect that all of our patients deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for that really important talk. I think a lot of us struggle with this um, and struggle, especially folks that are starting out um, to identify and, and really start to work and treat folks with substance use disorder. It can be really hard not only to change the bias in our mind, but but to understand how we talk with folks. And you know, one of the questions that's come up, I think, folks that are new to identifying and treating patients with substance use disorder, sometimes there's a feeling of, I don't wanna get into it because what if I don't know the answer? What if I fail? What if I say the wrong thing to this person? And I wonder, do you have any advice to those new healthcare providers who, who want to incorporate this, but are a little bit hesitant that they think they might not know everything to do this? Yeah, I keep thinking of the Maya Angelou quote. I, I'm not going to get it right, but it goes something along the lines of long after they've forgotten what you said, they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. Right? So you're not expected to have all the answers. You're not supposed to be experts in everything, and in, in often the patient will help you. But if you speak to people with respect, and, and, and honor their dignity, um, that itself builds alliance between you and that person. And, and actually one of the most consistent findings in all of the addiction treatment literature is that the most important thing in, in treatment outcomes is alliance between the, uh, the clinician and the patient. So speaking kindly, speaking respectfully. If there's something you don't understand, being curious and asking about it, um, being humble, um, all of those things will go a very long way in terms of building therapeutic alliance and helping people move forward. In terms of factual knowledge, um, yeah, you're not expected to know everything. Uh, we have great resources uh, around the institution. Um, certainly should feel free to call, uh, email or call me or Dr. Soares, uh, who just asked that wonderful question. Um, and, but there are also resources, all kinds of resources around the state um, to help us um, and around the nation. So like for, for, for uh, clinicians, for example, there is the Physician Clinical Support System that is run through the American uh, uh, Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. Um, you can sign up and get a mentor if you wanna learn how to do medication treatment or have somebody you can turn to. Um, but we have a lot of folks around who are willing to do curbsides. We have a fantastic new addiction consult service at the uh, Bay State Medical Center. So Steve Rzevich and his team are uh, you know, at the ready to help. Um, so there, there are a lot of resources, but I think in terms of saying the wrong thing with a patient, um, I think if you approach them with kindness and dignity and respect, um, you'll, you'll see what an amazing result you will get. A lot of these patients are used to being treated quite badly in medical settings. That's one of the big reasons for this, for this uh, Words Matter initiative. You really want to let these patients know that we want to help them and that we have tools to help them. And even though you may not know everything about all the tools to say, you know what, I don't know, but I'm willing to find out and work with you, that will really go a long way. That's great. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a really important answer for people to understand, especially coming away from this conference. One other question that comes to mind, I think sometimes I think for many of us here, hopefully we believe or now believe that medication um, for opioid use disorder is important, but how do you approach the patient who maybe still has that stigma saying, you know, no, I don't wanna start this because I don't wanna substitute one drug for another. How do you put that to the patient who may not have the knowledge of pathophysiology or, or other things that the provider may have? Well, you know, I often, 
you know, every, I, I often use the diabetes analogy as we did in the talk uh, with patients. Everyone, could, pretty much everyone knows somebody who's taking it or at least heard of it. And so they understand what that is. And often I will speak about that um, with patients. And I use that as a way to explain to them that, you know, there are a lot of myths and um, things said about medication treatment that uh, for opioid use disorder that are just not true. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but in general, you know, a lot of the patients I see have had some experience with it. So, um, but really what you're describing is folks who sort of internalize that, that stigma. And so speaking with them about what that means um, and how it's sort of affecting their choices um, is really important. And then explain to them that, you know, this is the most effective way to, 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 to get folks stabilized and to prevent overdose. Um, and, you know, I often will say to people like that, well, why don't we try it, see how it goes for months or a year. You can always stop. You can, you can always make a decision to stop it if you are feeling like it's not working for you or, um, you know, you still believe it is not something that you want to do. Um, you know, a, a lot, and this, we've seen this a lot in the, in the current opioid crisis, a lot of folks have come around, a lot of folks who were like staunch anti-medication people have seen because of the risk of overdose. Uh, you know, if you send somebody to an abstinence-based program and you take away their tolerance and they go out and use, then they're at very high risk for overdose. And medication that we use, most of the agonists will maintain uh, their tolerance and save their life. So really in speaking about this as a life-threatening illness and uh, medication as something that will save their life, many folks will say, okay, I'm willing to give that a try. Um, uh, but it, you know, it is a challenge. I think, I think there are the, the, the stigma and the cultural issues are not just within medicine, it's really within all of society. Perfect. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Key points from the lecture include issues of behavior and judgment are often manifestations of the disease of substance use disorder, not reflections of the person. Words matter. Use person-centered, non-pejorative words, such as person with substance use disorder. Medication is treatment. Medication does not make a person's recovery less meaningful. 